Welcome everybody um, to the Regenibus Member Network, our monthly meeting. We're delighted to have you all. We actually have quite a, a large community today. This is uh, this is going going live. This one um, in connection with our partners at Merge, uh, which is for their re-emerge 420 live uh, event. So we're delighted to be collaborating on that. Um, I mean, we've got people from all over the world. Uh, in, in pretty much every continent tuning in. So we're, we're, we're super excited for that. And may I take this opportunity, of course, to wish everybody a happy 420 um, on this uh, very prestigious day. Of course, 420 is not just for recreational and we focus very much on, on the medical side and the HEM side. So I think as 420 evolves over the next few, few years, um, we'll start to incorporate many other aspects of this beautiful cannabis industry. Um, before we go into our, our panelists and our discussion, I just want to give you a quick, quick uh, some updates on what's been happening at Regenibus and, and in the industry. Uh, today, we saw the House of Representatives approve the Cannabis Safe, Bank, uh, Safe Banking Bill, which is uh, another huge milestone for the industry um, and another you know, uh, step forward in the right direction for, for us all, particularly here, obviously, here in North America. And what happens typically in North America will will hopefully we'll see a domino effect globally. Um, so I mean, there's been a huge amount happening in the industry. On 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 the Regenibus side, we continue to deliver to the ESG sustainability. Um, we continue to drive that uh, conversation. Uh, we're working with a number of multi-state operators in the U.S. and Canadian LPs. In addition to new conversations hap happening with UK companies now. Uh, and and one or two Colombian companies too. So, um, uh, company cannabis companies are really beginning to start to think about sustainability, ESG as not just a nice to have on the side, but really core to their business and a real business driver for a multitude of reasons. So we've been we've been very very busy on that, and we expect to get only busier, uh, which is which is a great sign of maturing and uh, for the for the industry. Um, we've also been working on, on building out the distribution network uh, from, from Latin America into Europe and, and now into Asia PAC. Um, and we've been helping the US brands move into the UK and U uh, European market, which is also very exciting because these are great, great leading brands in the US that are looking to get their foothold in, in, um, in, in different markets. Um, I mentioned last week, and we discussed very briefly last week on our, um, with regards to the UN events, the, the UN partnered events. Um, we are going to be launching that now in, in, in May. We're, we're super excited to share that with you. Uh, the first virtual event will be at the end of June. Um, more details to come on that. And then the in-person event at the United Nations will be in October. Um, again, the whole purpose behind these particular events and, and bringing in the United Nations is to really to deliver the conversations around why we need to normalize, uh, regulate and legalize cannabis and hemp globally and how that drives impact both economic, socially and environmentally, and then how it drives the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be sharing much more about that um, uh, during the launch. It's going to be a multi-stakeholder event with, with large cannabis companies, big media, big finance, government, UN, uh, and, and uh, corporations of Fortune 500 coming together to talk about what the art of the possible is and, and the reason why this wonderful plant uh, needs to be regulated, uh, legalized globally. Um, and finally, on the Regenibus piece, we will be launching um, the Regenibus Ventures Fund uh, very, very soon. That's a private equity ESG fund. We're very, very excited about that because it's one of the only uh, um, uh, funds in the industry uh, where we will be investing in startups and scale-ups in the cannabis industry that have a, a ESG play that are committed to sustainability so we'll be able to deploy capital into those companies so we can help those companies become the leading sustainable brands and companies of the future. Um, so that's, we'll be, we'll be sharing more about that uh, in, in our next meeting. Um, and then just some, some 
movement in the market over the last four weeks since our last meeting. Um, again, we're seeing more and more corporations of Fortune 500 companies enter this space. We all know that Heineken, Levi's, Nestle, um, and, and several others are already engaged in some for, in, in various different forms, whether it's in the recreational side, the medical, and or the hemp. Um, recently, we saw PepsiCo release their uh, their energy drink, which is the hemp seed uh, infused energy drink. Um, I haven't got to taste it yet, but I'm looking forward to trying that one out. And and also Colgate Palm Olive, Palm Olive have been moving forward with their two with their CBD uh, infused toothpaste which we're also looking forward to trying out. So um, very excited about the movement on that front. And we'll continue to work on the back end with a lot of these companies, Fortune 500 companies who are kind of curious, um, who are looking to find a community to engage in the cannabis industry. Uh, and we, we are, you know, we've set up Regenibus, the Regenibus community to be one of those communities where they do engage. Um, so we've uh, we've some exciting news to share on that front. Obviously, many of these companies are uh, conservative and unwilling to publicly talk about these uh, their engagement until federal legalization. Um, so we'll be we'll be discussing that too. Um, and obviously, there's been a huge amount of consolidation and uh, in 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 the industry. And you know, I mean, it's been happening for quite some time, but particularly, it's ramped up in the last four weeks. Uh, and we saw our friends at EMAC um, with a recent acquisition through uh, LeafWire uh, as we see the US MSOs move into the European market. We're gonna see a lot more of that. And we've been working for several years with our partners in, 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 in the UK and Europe. Um, and there's some exciting times ahead for, for these companies. These, they're building out amazing companies. And um, the great thing about their, this is, is that they're really beginning to think about ESG and sustainability uh, being baked into the core of their their business, uh, and we're, we're we're going to be helping with them. Uh, additionally, um, Mexico is obviously uh, on the cusp of of full legalization, um, and with our partners in Mexico, we're going to be really really embedding the sustainable development goals at the government level and and supporting a lot of the leaders in the in the Mexican industry. Uh, we're, we're we're very very uh, honored to be part of that community. Um, it's real, real leadership and real, they're showcasing the the, um, the fundamentals of building a purpose-driven industry down there. So we're very, very excited about that. And then last but not least, uh, we want to thank Bob, Bob Hoban, who's on, on the, on the, in the meeting here um, for the mention in the Forbes article recently around ESG uh, impact in the cannabis industry. It got a huge amount of traction a huge amount of visibility and, and really, again, crossed into the mainstream world where, where the mainstream world are really beginning to take uh, note of the maturity and the professionalism of the cannabis industry. So uh, again, very appreciated to Bob and um, for, for mentioning us and several of our, 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 our friends and partners that are on in this meeting too. So if you, if anybody has any questions or any um, would like to get in touch with us at Regenibus, feel free to reach out at info at Um That's the email that you can catch any of us uh, and we'll be, we'll be very happy to hear from you. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jeff Trotter, the CAR co-founder and uh, Chief Growth Officer at Regenibus to kick off the first of our three panel, panel conversations. And again, happy 20. Uh, 420 to everyone. Jeff. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Those that have visuals on, if you could just give me a thumbs up so I'll know that we're good. That's great. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome, uh, four panelists. I'll introduce those in a, in a, uh, four in a, in a short moment. Welcome all those that you can see on the screen because they're either a Regenibus member network, member organization um, affiliate, or they're an advisory board member or both. Um, so welcome to, to everybody. I know that there is a group of folk who are tuning in as guests. Um, ordinarily, as Patrick said, these uh, Regenibus member network uh, meetings are behind closed doors. We Something we call the Chatham House rules. Um, on this occasion, as we did in January, we decided to throw it open to the general public because we felt that we had some content that was truly worth sharing. Plus also, as many of you have mentioned, it's 420, so there's a great gift that we're giving to a broader community. 
Um, thrilled to have everybody joining. I will give a shout out to a couple of folks. Uh, Gina Cranwinkle, who we know from uh, NACB, is tuning in all the way from New Zealand. Um, so happy Wednesday to you. Um, and also uh, to a very, very good friend of mine, a uh, former colleague of mine from my days back uh, when I was with Ernst & Young, a chap called Danendra Sivaraja, who's tuning in from Malaysia, who's got an exciting new business up and running. I know you can't speak or say anything to me, Danendra, but it's great to see you uh, and hope to catch up with you soon. But welcome to everybody else, whether I know you are or don't. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled to have you here. Um, just a quick correction on something Patrick referenced. I don't know if any of you caught it, unless he's predicting the future when he said EMAC was acquired by LeafWire, it was, it was actually CureLeaf. CureLeaf, Cure um, yeah. Uh, the good news is though, we do often predict the future. So Peter, be ready. <laughs> uh, Thanks so um, for that. Yeah, no worries. I was like, oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome everybody. The, the, the run of play, um, uh, for the day is to say we've got a, a three panels uh, and and what four panelists the first panel the panelist is uh, Sherry Haskell founder and CEO at Canna Angels um, we'll be speaking a little bit about angel investing in the cannabis and the hemp industry uh, very much looking forward to that the second panel which will be around about sort of 935 um, will be with Peter Vogel, who is the CEO of LeafWire. He's doing an amazing job um, with what others reference and why we shouldn't also reference it is, you know, LeafWire is, is some, somewhat akin to the, the LinkedIn of the cannabis world. Uh, I think it's more than that. And I think what Peter is, is developing and is creating is phenomenal. Uh, he is also a phenom, as we would say. So it's great to have Peter here. Um, and then our third panel, um, has two panelists, uh, Kelly Perez, who is the president, and Courtney Mathis, the CEO of a group called Cannabis Doing Good and a, a number of other affiliates. Uh, it's, uh, they must have three or four business cards, which we love. Um, we'll be speaking with Kelly and Courtney around creating a purpose-driven cannabis community. So building on the sense of a community that, that Peter is doing, and then getting into how do we then create a purpose-driven cannabis community. And purpose centricity is something that's really fundamental to the work that Patrick and I are building out at Regenibus. Um, we see that there is a need for businesses to, to lead with purpose, um, to not only deliver an economic impact, but also to deliver a social impact and an environmental impact. And as Patrick referenced, all of the work that we're doing at Regenibus ties back to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And, 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 and so we see as a critical build out of this industry uh, recognition that we have uh, accountability and responsibility as leaders to ensure that the industry grows to be the best version of itself. Um, so thrilled to have everybody here. Should we, uh, I would ask and encourage folks to drop questions into Q&A or into the chat. Uh, I myself or Patrick will monitor that um, and but we'll unless there's a, a real burning question um, we, we you know we'll, we'll save the questions until the end of each um, uh, each panel uh, we may only have time for one or two questions for each panel but then we could go to a general Q&A at the end and then we'll do a wrap-up so without uh, any further ado um, let me uh, welcome first um, uh, I reference Peter as a phenom. I, I think Sherry Haskell is really quite extraordinary um, on a number of fronts. Uh, Patrick referenced Regenibus Ventures and uh, the launch of our own impact investment fund. Um, we, we could look nowhere else really than to get some steer around the investment world in the cannabis space, certainly in early stage seed capital than Sherry who has a, an incredible track record. What I also find really quite remarkable is that a number of folks that I have spoken to in the last couple of years in the cannabis industry, Sherry somehow is not on their radar. And I love that about the fact that she somehow is flying beneath a radar, just getting it done. Um, uh, currently with a portfolio of uh, nearly 50 companies, 49 companies, many in the cannabis hemp space. 
it's uh, safe to say that um, that her organization, Canna Angels, enjoys a standing few have really experienced in this industry. Founded in 2016 um, and chosen by the Business Insider as a rising star of marijuana's investment scene, as they called it, um, she really has been at the forefront of cannabis investing. And we are very appreciative that, that she's here just to share a little bit of her own story. I, I don't suspect she'd share so much of her secret sauce, but that would be nice. Uh, <laughs> and then um, one of the things that Sherry and I have, have uh, and Patrick have been chatting about over the last few months is hemp. Uh, so there's a massive focus on cannabis. And when we talk about the cannabis industry, we look at three sectors, the recreational, the medical and wellness space. And then we look at hemp, which uh, we feel truly could be a game changer if we can build a robust hemp industry and then build that globally. So Sherry, um, welcome. And I'm thrilled to have you here uh, and to, to, be, to be part of this morning's show. Um, Jeff, with that intro, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you, I ought to bring you on board and just have you <laughs> as an agent, uh, but thank you so much, right? Uh, it's interesting because earlier in the program when you um, and Patrick were talking, I had a little bit of an epiphany um, because on our website, on the Canna Angels website, we have an area that illustrates our portfolio. And I think now we're almost, I think maybe we're at 50 companies and they are categorized by different verticals, uh, the companies that fall within various verticals. And I will say that our focus over the last four years, pretty much over the last four years has been very much uh, with a direct affinity toward technology plays uh, for a number of reasons. So you'll see that we are heavy in the technologies which could be biotech or data tech or compliance tech, uh, lab tech, um, agri-tech in particular, things like mm -hmm. that. And it occurred to me a little while ago that perhaps we should create a new vertical and that vertical will be ESG companies. And I think I'll do that. I think that that will be a new vertical within our, within our space, within our industry. Why not? Right. Well, we're having coffee next week to plan that out. Let's, let's get that okay. in the calendar uh, because okay. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that's, as Patrick was referencing, we see from our own perspective, from a funding uh, uh, lens that uh, all of the organizations we will be investing in will have a propensity towards ESG or indeed they're already on track. And, and, and we see that in the cannabis hemp industry, this will be a critical part, whether it's in the private space or perhaps more importantly in the public space. So all of those companies that are, that are listed either here in the United States or in, in, in Canada will need, to, will need to go on this ESG journey because it's being demanded of them. So, well, uh, it's yeah. very, very timely. Um, I just happened to notice this morning an article that came out from Hemp Daily um, uh, letting us know about Biden's new uh, mandates for carbon sequestration. And uh, there is a uh, proposal on, on the table now to create a carbon bank with farmers to be able to pay farmers for cultivating certain crops that would facilitate this. And of course that would be hemp. Um, so this is something pretty exciting and that would be a major, major facilitator for the hemp industry. Yeah, in fact, uh, on the subject of news articles, I, I read an, an article too, also around carbon, carbon sequestration, carbon sinks, which is uh, with a group, uh, an indigenous group, the Yurok tribe in Northern California, Southern, Southern Oregon, who are already setting up um, a, a, a carbon capture process and therefore a, a sort of uh, carbon offsets, which I think it will also herald quite an interesting market opportunity. I think this is when you start seeing the, the, the finance world start getting a little bit more excited about what's going on. And then of course, with the Safe Banking Act now on track to be passed, the biggest F of them all, the finance industry will start piling into this space, which is no bad thing. So. Well, we're already seeing that. We're seeing that a little bit more dominantly in Canada than we are here in the US. But then of course, you know, they're, they're predecessors to us in, mm -hmm. in all of this. Um, but myself, I've been involved 
deeply involved with a, um, a hemp uh, harvester, producer, manufacturer in Canada for the last six months. Um, and right now, uh, they are ha having orders that are beyond their capacity to fill. And those orders fill everything from building materials to bedding for animals, to plastics, uh, textiles. I, th I think that the general public really needs to get an education as to the, the uh, capacity and capabilities of industrial hemp, true hemp, not just hemp for CBD, which is what seems to be the mainstream orientation. Yeah, I, again, I couldn't agree more. I think that's certainly something that at Regenibus we've been um, lauding quite a bit and posting on LinkedIn, et cetera, around the disruption that can happen if we get the industrial hemp complex, let's call it that, if we can get it up and running. I mean, we, we somewhat joke that any industry that begins with the letter F is about to be disrupted. <laughs> Food, finance, farming, uh, fibers, um, fashion, we already see there's, there's some disruption and innovation in that space. And I agree, the education aspect is something that we need to get very quickly towards, you know, beyond, beyond prohibition. Well, if we're going to look at this, I mean, my area of expertise is really capital markets and the investment arena. And so if we're looking at this from investment opportunities, uh, which this is going to be massive, this is leading edge right now. And I feel that we've got a runway for another few years where you can actually get in at very low valuations. And if you find the right team and the right product, you know, this could be like uh, cannabis was five, six years ago. Um, but I think also that what, uh, of course, my brain always goes to the technology place, and I feel that opportunities here are very precedent in the supply chain aspects of the industry, because right now that is very developmental. And so we're looking at opportunities, not just in the harvesting and the production, but in the supply chain and the logistics. That is a major bottleneck right now, which yep. needs to be corrected. And so it's a, it's a land of opportunity. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I, when we look at, uh, we often say that one of the biggest challenges, that two of the biggest challenges in, in the cannabis hemp industry, uh, let's go three. We've already talked about education, the hurdle that we need to clear in a post-prohibition era. I think we also need to look at uh, the notion around packaging. Packaging is a scourge of any industry, uh, but it certainly can be changed and disrupted because of hemp. There's a huge opportunity there. Well, now uh, you know that you're hitting a sweet spot for me. Exactly, I was, <laughs> I was meaningfully and purposefully going there. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and also to, to sort of speak about supply chain. Again, supply chains in any industry are a right. challenge because fundamentally what we are seeking as consumers is transparency in order to build trust. And we need a robust supply chain. So I think if you look at the hemp sector and you look at the opportunity that, that hemp can then create in disruptive industries, but can also, you know, if, if there's a tech play around uh, having a better understanding of a supply chain and how you can swiftly, in a just-in-time kind of way that the Japanese invented 15, no, uh, what am I talking about, 50 years ago, then that I think is where the opportunity is. And I know it's a sweet spot of yours because in the last few conversations we've had, I, I could see your eyes light up when we talk about hemp and the opportunity there. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's, what are the organizations that you're looking at? Can you share some of the companies that you're looking at? Of course I can. Be careful what you ask for, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I do want to mention, a, a moment ago you mentioned packaging. And one of our portfolio companies that is one of my favorites is Santa Packaging. And Santa was way ahead of the curve. You know, Santa came through Canna Angels, you know, as I said to you, I think it was 2017. Uh, maybe the beginning of 2018, I haven't gone back to look and see, but um, this is a team that was on the leading edge of creating all of their packaging through hemp products. And in the beginning, you know, it was a little of a head scratcher, but now they are really dominant in the industry and they're doing great. And I see we're gonna, you know, we're gonna see more and more companies like this. Uh, the Canadian company that I'm working with right now, which is of course still privately held, uh, which we're doing a big launch with uh, is uh, Tricome Agronomy. 
and that's out of Manitoba, Canada. They are one of the largest producers in North America for industrial hemp. And when we say industrial hemp, what we're really talking about is what they refer to as whole plant. So in other words, hemp, as most people refer to, is the top of the plant where the flower is produced. And the flower is then produced primarily for CBD. But when we talk about whole plant, we talk about the entire stalk. So that we're using the fiber and the herd, and this gets into all kinds of different components of the plant. And often when I'm talking about supply chain, what we've learned is that this is not a terribly easy plant to harvest because of the nature of the plant. It's great for the ecosystem. I mean, it's a, it's a soil uh, sequester. It is uh, non-combustible, if you will, okay? It, it uh, also derives seed that is healthier, one of the highest protein products on the planet but it's not easy to harvest. It's very tough and it has to go through certain kinds of equipment, which because it has not been legal in the US until recently, we don't have that equipment. So we're, we're using some of the technologies from Europe and from China and customizing into the US. And this is all still new in the US, which is where I see the opportunities. Uh, but Tricone is one of those companies right now, they are harvesting uh, about 9,000 acres in Manitoba, harvesting for the fiber and the herd and the seed and all the other byproduct. So it's going to be a biggie. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, and uh, you know, on, on the, the regenerative agriculture play as well, um, you know, I think that's a super important area uh, that hemp can really deliver to and drive um, as we sort of move Again, we need to move away from a monocrop culture to a multi-crop culture. And look I, at I, think it's, I think it's going to be really interesting because I don't know if you follow, and you know me, my head is always in capital markets, um, which is kind of crazy. But uh, Larry Fink, who is the chairman of BlackRock Capital, one of the largest asset managers in the world, in his letter to CEOs this year, he made a mandate and he said that they were only going to be investing in portfolios who had an ESG standing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is a big mandate. Uh, and if the companies couldn't document their ESG man, their ESG, you know, uh, platform, they weren't going to be considered for the portfolio. I mean, think about how important that is. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, yeah. It's very, I, again, I think, we're seeing that in some we referenced it in earlier webinars and podcasts that you know the fortune 500 93 percent of the fortune 500 currently have an esg report on an annual basis 93 percent the others have a report not quite an esg report but at least it's an external facing report that that others can see that is is aligned to some environmental and or social play but 93 percent. if we were to look at the 200 plus publicly listed cannabis companies right now, you wouldn't even find 0.9% that have an ESG uh, focus. And that is where there is a challenge. It needs to happen primarily because they will operate better. They will be better financially managed, better strategically managed. But as Patrick also alluded to, there are, no, there are an awful lot of organizations that are, let's, let's call it, you know, established businesses and established industries that are looking uh, at the cannabis and hemp space, and they will be demanding ESG um, focus in those organizations. Otherwise, they, they'll, they'll walk away from any deal, any potential deal. So I, I think that's a fascinating area, and, and it's one that we'll-, we'll Isn't it great to be at the, at the forefront of something so exciting as this? And, you know, getting back to what we were saying in the beginning of the conversation, education is key. I mean, it's, it's key for everybody. Uh, especially in the cannabis industry, but for mainstream and for industry and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, at Canna Angels, we're going to be putting on a, um, a webinar uh, in the near future. Um, we don't have the date actually solid yet, but anybody who might want to attend, just drop me an email or something. We're lining up a, a, a roster of industry 
experts, every, everyone from plastics companies to textiles companies, 3M, so on, other companies like that that are really seriously either looking at or right now participating in the industrial true hemp part of the industry. Right. Well, make sure you share your details uh, at some point okay. throughout the next hour or so uh, in okay. chat. Uh, okay. And when and when you have that webinar all set up, of course, uh, Patrick and well, I, well, through our, yeah. our right. solid marketing machine, will ensure that we are um, we're, we're pushing that out to our community love too. It. Love it. Um, you know, Patrick, I see that you've unmuted. That generally tells me you're about to jump in with a question or two. I, I may be wrong. I, I, in this case, you're actually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're typically right. No, no, but I think you make a very good point. Just, uh, just while the, the floor is there, um, Sherry on on 3M, you know, they're they're moving into hemp-based uh, uh, adhesives, and and we're going to see more and more of this. And uh, again, we've been speaking with the many of the core uh, Fortune 500s on the back end um, that are doing a lot of research and due diligence on on hemp uh, supply and, and products innovation and then the companies that they want to be working with and as Jeff alluded to there these companies must have sustainability and ESG embedded within them if they're to play with these corporations there's no doubt about that um, this is this is the big league as they say and the industry is really uh, maturing and, and uh, growing up very very fast the cannabis industry in the hemp um, so that was my only my, my only point to that Jeff yeah, well, I, I, so let me just sort of add to that too. Um, I made a bold prediction a week or so ago. I stick by it uh, that I maintain that by the time we get to the end of 2030, which will be uh, the end of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, that if we take a snapshot now of the Fortune 500, the, the, the Fortune 500 will be called the Hemp 500. I would predict that pretty much every organization in the Fortune 500 will have some play in the hemp space. That is bold. <laughs> that's 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 my bold prediction. That is bold. Why not? Why I not? hope you're right. I, I'm yeah. Well, let's make it. Let's make it happen. Uh, okay. Let's make it. I'm on my way. Yeah, so I see you. that. Um, Sherry, once again, it's been wonderful. Um, to, to, to have you waxing lyrical about all things that you've been doing. I, I love the, as I mentioned earlier, I love the fact that you're flying under the radar, getting all of these things done. Uh, for, for anybody listening, tuning in, watching, uh, take a look at cannaangelsllc.com and you'll see not only a, a, a wonderful website, but some crazy information about the verticals that uh, Sherry and the team have been investing in there for a period of time. And then as you scroll down the page, you'll see a bunch of logos of, uh, of many of the great and the good uh, cannabis companies. And, and um, you'd be amazed, frankly, uh, as I was, the, the, the sort of more I looked, I was like, wow. Thank you so much, Jeff. Portfolio. It'd be wonderful. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you um, post-show. We've got lots of other things to be talking about, but wonderful to have you here. And thanks again, Sherry. Everybody, Sherry Haskell. Uh, Canna Angels LLC.com and she'll put her email uh, details. I am doing that account. now. Great. Wonderful. Uh, thanks again. Um, we're going to move somewhat from investing and we're going to go and start uh, having a conversation around networking. Uh, so, Peter, um, are you there? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, Jeff? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. How are you? Looking good? Uh, doing great. Excited to be on and uh, loved listening to your and Sherry's conversation. So, uh, Well, no pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate all the insights, Sherry. Sherry. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if you guys know each other. Um, if you don't, I, I suspect that you ought to. Um, uh, it's been a while, but we, we had a conversation probably, I mean, probably two years ago. A couple of years ago, right. Yeah. It's I remember, been a while, but uh, LeafWire has been out there, you know, ra raising money in a few different rounds for long enough that we've we've bumped into most most folks in the industry. Yeah. Well, um, I see. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Peter and I have um, been kind of working together over the last uh, six months or so on on um, a a side project uh, which we both love um, with Emerge that uh, Charles Warner has been running since September last year and it just finished its third iteration 
Um, in fact, there is, of course, re-emerge 420 happening today, and you'll be able to, to uh, catch a recording of this particular meeting on the re-emerge 420. But Peter and I have been working on uh, the pitch contest that we've been um, running there since, since that first event. And we've had a lot of fun doing that, where we've been bringing in some, some great investors. Of course, no doubt, we'll be bringing Sherry into that uh, play uh, at the next iteration. Um, but, but you know, one of the things that I've uh, really got to enjoy is, is, is not only from a distance watching Peter and what he's been doing with LeafWire, but also having the opportunity to sort of catch up with him on a regular basis and, and just sort of hear him speak about some of the successes and, and you know, some of the, the hair-raising moments. And uh, we, we're going to dive into some of that as well, because I know that as you were getting to the close uh, of your most recent um, round of, of funding, it was it was getting close to the wire, but it, it, it ended up providing you with a different set of skills and some knowledge that you can you can now share. So we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. But um, Peter, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit before we dive into some 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 questions and some uh, and dialogue? Why don't you just uh, tell the folks listening and tuning in um, the the sort of background to LeafWire and when that all uh, kicked off? Sure. Um, so back in 2017, uh, so I guess I've been in Canvas now for about four years, and my experience was working uh, in the tech startup space, and I've been a part of. I've both been a, a founder and an employee of multiple tech startups in the mostly digital marketing advertising space um, back starting in the dot-com days. So we've been building companies for the last 20 years or so. But uh, one of my colleagues who is currently the, the, the CEO of a company called Simplify, um, Marion Rathison was a, was a good friend of mine uh, in the tech startup space. And about four years ago, we had lunch and told me him and some investors had this idea for LeafWire um, and, and we're looking for someone to jump in and do it. And I, at the time, had a full-time job, but was in an industry that was much less exciting and a kind of relatively in, in, in an industry that hadn't had much, cha and much change in many years. And I saw, I saw cannabis as this huge opportunity. Uh, and back then, you know, there were you know, half as many states legal or probably less. Um, and there was a lot more stigma around it, but I'd been living in Denver for so long to me, working in cannabis seemed completely normal. So, so we jumped in and we, we started building and raised some money. We did our friends and family round, and then we launched LeafWire in about two days, 2018. Uh, and we did, the way we launched it was actually with a pitch contest, similar to what we've been doing. Uh, we, we did, LeafWire hosted about, I think we did about 12 pitch contests around the country from LA to Miami to <clears throat> Denver up to we did Vancouver I think Toronto uh, and that's one of the ways we kind of got our name out there in the beginning is by just hosting these pitch contests with all these different events and um, we you know we saw back in 2018 we we saw a need that there was this huge business community you know and a lot of people uh, outsiders uh, look at cannabis and they see just uh, the growers and people who work in dispensaries and that's about it. Yep. But there's such a massive part of the industry, probably four or five times the size, the, the non-plant touching side, which includes, you know, what Sherry was talking about earlier, you know, the, the packaging people, the shipping people, the lighting people, the fertilizer people, the everything, you know, every single service provider that works with the cannabis industry, we saw this massive group of people and we wanted to provide a very focused place where they could get together, network, share news in a completely safe environment. At the time, and still is the case, there are a lot of social media outlets that do censor and or cancel groups. Um, or we saw, you know, there's a LinkedIn, uh, which I, I love LinkedIn. That's one of the reasons I wanted to start LeafWire I've been using LinkedIn since 2006, I think, and I'm almost up to 30,000 followers. So for me, I use LinkedIn every day. I use LeafWire every day, of course. So we always tell people there's no reason you have to only use one or the other, but we just wanted to create that very, very focused place where people could share all the news they want about the industry, cannabis and hemp, uh, could post jobs, could promote events, and they would know that one, it was safe, uh, they would never have their information censored or deleted, and that mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, it can always be 100% the focus. There's not going to be, you know, 50 other industries competing for attention. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things that I've, uh, this is fascinating, because one of the things I've really enjoyed learning about you and, and as I've, I've dug a little bit deeper and on the back of conversations is actually the, the breadth and depth of your experience in pretty much other industries. And these are, these are skills that, of course, are immediately transferable into, into this industry as it, as it grows, which is no doubt something that, um, that others have seen in, in you know, bringing you in as a CEO and saying, run with this idea. Because I, I, it, as I say, I've really enjoyed um, learning more about all of those smarts. Um, funding and or, or seeking funding um, is is probably first nature to you <laughs> not even second nature right um, would that be a fair comment well it would be accurate to say we haven't stopped in the last four years <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if that means that it's second nature to me but it's just a constant a relatively constant need yeah uh, and it's partly because we haven't done you know big you know five million dollar rounds uh, we did a friends and family round that was about 200,000. Mm -hmm. So obviously that only gets you so far. Yeah. Uh, then we did do a seed round, which we finished pretty quickly at, at, for about a million dollars. Uh, and that, you know, funded us through the next year or two. Um, and that's right about where we were starting to look at, should we do a, and, and, th and those, just to be clear, th th those are both kind of traditional Reg D rounds where we had accredited investors people typically were investing minimums of, you know, 25,000 or more. Mm -hmm. um, so a pretty typical startup round, I would say. Um, and then towards the end of, I guess it would be 2019, we're looking at whether we, 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 we were still only, you know, two full-time people and we, we have offshore tech development in Sri Lanka. We were looking at, you know, how do we, how do we build a team a little bit? How do we do more marketing? How do we, it's, it's really hard to do everything you want to do with two people. <laughs> uh, and, I hear you. Yeah, and you uh, see, so, you, so you're you're not only uh, resource constrained in terms of funding, but in terms of just time, and you know all, all these different things we're chasing. You have to figure out what do you, how do you possibly spend your time efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so we figured it would be smarter to do a, a convertible note round as kind of like a bridge before we did the Series A, because we we weren't as far along as we wanted in order to set a valuation that we thought was what we're looking for. So we said, let's do a convertible note with a 15% discount to our eventual series A. Um, and we started that right at the end of 2019. And we actually got in, we were, we were trying to raise about a million. We, we got in about $400,000 pretty quickly and it was going great. And then February hit and, hmm. you know, the pandemic kicked in and it was like, uh, for us at least, uh, it was almost like beating your head against a wall for like six or eight months that it just wasn't a great time. A lot of people were afraid to spend money. A lot of people were pulling back from the market, trying to figure out, you know, is this actually going to be a huge depression? Is this pandemic actually going to spin out of control? Like what's, what's happening in the world? Um, so that kind of just got stuck for, you know, six to eight months. And that's when we decided to go the crowdfunding route. Uh, so we, uh, we essentially took our convertible note that we were raising, uh, went out, talked to a bunch of different companies. Uh, you know, there's Start Engine, Republic.co, a bunch of others. We, we, we Funder, I think is one. Um, Arcview, I think actually just launched one as well that they're promoting. Uh, but we, we ended up working with Seed Invest. And uh, Seed in, on Seed Invest, we, you know, put together the campaign and it is relatively, uh, you have to do a pretty pretty lengthy financial review with an outside firm. Uh, you've put together a lot of marketing materials, a pretty significant profile. It, it took us several months to get ready. And then you run a, I think we for us it was a 60 day campaign. And you do you do have to kind of market yourself during the whole thing. You can't just rely on them. So it was a lot of a lot of marketing, a lot of webinars, um, <clears throat> a lot of putting out you know, articles, marketing, et cetera. Uh, and it is, you, you kind of mentioned this earlier, the, the kind of um, nerve wracking part about all of it is, and it's very common for the, you know, those crowdfunding rounds, you get a lot of your money in in the last week or two. Uh, so you, you work and work and work for 60 days and you're, you're still only, you know, 50 
be 60% to what you need. And there are minimums. You, you don't get the money out unless you reach certain minimums. So for us, it was literally within the last few days where we passed our minimum. And then we went, you know, hundreds of thousands above it. Uh, but it was uh, uh, like literally like day 57, day 58, mm. until we even knew if it was going to be successful. So it wow. was uh, relatively uh, stressful. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, now looking back, it all seems great. It was all worth it. But at the time, uh, at the time, it was uh, uh, very, very stressful. And uh, yeah, uh, well, if it means anything, Peter, you look great with gray hair. So don't worry oh, about I, it. I have more gray hair now than ever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wow. There, it's 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 funny you say that. There, uh, my my wife has told me that each time I I start a different company at the end of two, three, four years, I, I have like thirty percent more gray hair. <laughs> and, and, yeah, uh, she's convinced it's tied. It's not just age; it's tied directly to the the, the stress of uh, uh, startups. Well, it's still there. That's a good thing. Uh, it's <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Just changing color. Um, I I, I want to, if you don't mind. Um, just pivot a little bit from the investing side and the mechanics uh, behind where you are right now to the the actual um, platform itself. Um, there's, you know, one could argue is what has been the reaction of the public as as LeafWire has has um, has grown. But I suppose one of the the, the most obvious questions is you know, what has the user base growth looked like? I mean, that's that that's a, a, a probably one of the best indicators of the reaction of, of the public, so to speak. So could you tell us a little bit more about that and the trajectory uh, and how that's how that's working out? Yeah, for sure. So we've we've grown pretty steadily year over year. We're up to about 40,000 people that have joined, uh, 40,000 individuals that have come on, created profiles. And these are, you know, like I mentioned earlier, this ranges from you know, HR companies, shipping, we, we, shipping, and you know, it's funny, but I keep coming back to packaging. We actually see a lot of packaging companies on there. There's more and more coming from the outside of cannabis as well that is trying to kind of cash in on, yeah. uh, on the growing industry. Uh, but <clears throat> we have, you know, legal people, finance people, investors, growers, uh, CBD brands. Um, and then we have some people that are just advocates in the industry we have a lot of can the cannabis press people come regularly. Uh, Charles Warner, for example, he, he posts his news uh, very regularly. Uh, we have uh, Alex Halperin from Weed Week posting very regularly. MJ Biz Daily posts regularly. Um, Cannabis.net. Uh, a, a bunch of the other uh, publications are coming and posting their content on LeafWire, which is great. That's exactly what we want. So we're we're one, I think our name is getting more and more known where a lot of the other media is intentionally coming and promoting their media on our platform, which is great. Our members love it. Um, that 40,000 members uh, represents, it's about 17,000 companies. So just like, just like on a LinkedIn or a Facebook, you always join as an individual and then you link yourself to companies that you've worked for and it, it lists your current company. Mm -hmm. um, so that every time you post, uh, and if, for those who are not familiar with LeafWire, it's very similar. It looks kind of like a LinkedIn or a Facebook where you have your own profile and there's a news feed down the middle and people post articles, uh, people post information about events. Today, there's lots of people posting stuff about 420 <laughs> celebrations and yeah. wishing people happy 420, uh, people giving away like grab bags, of, you know, goodies and whatnot. Um, people post about jobs. Uh, a lot of people just post questions about, hey, does anyone know uh, anyone in Michigan who, you know, has a, um, you know, some a, a facility for something? Mm -hmm. um, people ask questions about policy. Uh, you see a bunch of le legal folks posting, you know, very detailed articles about uh, uh, new legislation in new states that are going legal. Um, and you see, just a very industry specific things. And I, I used an example that I just thought was funny. We posted a story once about a, a racehorse whose jockey had gotten suspended for using CBD to treat it after a race, uh, which, you know, people use for animals quite a bit. Um, and after that article was posted, there proceeded to be, I think, almost 40 comments, like it went down and down and down people arguing about the correct dosage of CBD for a horse 
depending on exactly what weight it was. Yeah. But it, it was literally like, I was amazed by the amount people kept going on. I mean, it was literally like w- one of the, close to the most comments like we've ever had. Yeah. But that's just an example of how like specific and detailed people can be, you know, yeah. on a platform that's like right. actually for that. You, you wouldn't see that in like a LinkedIn. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was just about to say, you wouldn't see that on a LinkedIn or other social media platforms. I think one of the, the things that I've enjoyed about, you know, interacting with LeafWire and the platform has been exactly that, that these are rabbit holes I'm happy to go down. If, if I can use that right. term, you know, it's generally if you're on, on another social media platform, you go down a rabbit hole, you, you forgot where you started. But I, I've always found the, the sort of content there in LeafWire as, as the platform grows in terms of number of users, it's tremendously informative. And, uh, and when you consider also that certainly in the United States, and I'm sure this will happen around the world, it's one of the fastest growing industries right now in terms of job creation. So the fact that there is a platform you know, leaf wire out there is, 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 I think it's an imperative that if you're in this industry, you, you tune in and you take a good look around and, and you get comfortable with that because I think what, you're, what you've created is, is, is really remarkable. So uh, it's awesome. Oh, thank, thank you for those kind words, Jeff. Uh, um, I, well, uh, I think also one of the things that, of course, is, you, you know, you got to sort of day 57, 58, there's a sigh of relief. Um, you've put in your, you've touched up your hair again, it's gone back a little darker. Uh, what's, what's next? What's, what, what's on the horizon for you, whether it's from a funding perspective or, or the aspirations in terms of the size of LeafWire? Um, do you have aspirations to kind of have more of a, of a, a more geographic uh, dispersed group? Is that, a, is that part of the plan? Could you speak a little um, bit more about what's happening in 2021 and beyond? Yes, uh, all of the above. So one, we want to double, triple, quadruple our member base, of course. Um, and we're, we're I- increasing marketing. We're looking to do lots of things to increase virality, to get more referrals. Um, currently, we are, we are international, as you know, since we are a website. Uh, about 95% or is it 92 or 93% are US, and then 4 or 5% are Canada. And then we have about 3 or 4% from the rest of the world. Uh, so we, we, do, we have members from Mm-hmm. Uh, from Zimbabwe and Costa Rica and Brazil and uh, Spain. I mean, we have members from all over the world. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, we'd love for that to keep growing. Um, one of the things we're really looking forward to this year, and this should help us grow in both acquisition and engagement, is launching our mobile app. So we've right. done everything we've done so far with just LeafWire being desktop. And you, there is a mobile optimized version that you can use on your phone, but it's not an app. So it's not as easy. It's a little bit of a pain. So building a mobile app and making it so that we can attract some potentially new younger demographics that might like apps more than desktop and now allowing it so all of our users, you know, you, you wake up in bed, you're sitting in the doctor's office, you're sitting in your car. It's just much easier for people to check in with LeafWire uh, on a constant basis. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing I will say is just because this is, I think this is so relevant in terms of timeliness, uh, the mobile app is going to make it key for us to be very involved in conferences. So, Mm. you know, conferences are coming back and conferences are huge in cannabis. Like lots of people go to four, five, six, seven, eight conferences a year. Um, We want to make the LeafWire app so that people can use it, not just to network when they're at home, but that when they're at an event, for example, we want LeafWire members, if they're both have the app, to be able to essentially hold their phone near each other, click a button, and be automatically connected. So it, a, t- a technology that's been out there, whether it's Bluetooth or NFC, but so that you can get rid of business cards. You don't have to hand business cards back and forth. You don't have to touch things. You can just you know share a connection on the phone and also make it so that you can hit a button on the phone and see how many of LeafWire members are within a mile of this location, mm-hmm. uh, which would you know be the conference and hotels all around it. So if you're at yep. a conference, you can say, like who of all my network is, is here, you can look, you see a list of 50, 100 people, and then you, I'm sure there's people on there you didn't know were going to be at the event. And so it gives yep. you a chance to then reach out to them and say, hey, I just saw you're at this event. You know, let's, let's meet up for a beer or coffee, whatever. Yeah. So enabling, we want LeafWire to be not just the go-to app for when you're sitting at home or you're in your car, but a tool for people to use at conferences. And yeah. 
that we think will be what drives a ton of people to use us more because they want to use us in all those lo locations as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's fantastic. I, I, I didn't know that the mobile app was coming. Um, I, I mean, from a platform perspective, that's great because you're absolutely right. Uh, users uh, are driven by content um, and, and relative specific timely content. And, and certainly, as you say, as we move back into a sort of more um, public world, that's great. Of course, it was not lost on me. And I know we're sort of getting towards the tail end of this particular panel. But it's not lost on me, of course, that um, as soon as you start talking about mobile apps and technology, that opens up a very different group of potential investors. Um, uh, and the promise of, of something very different. Uh, you know, I come from the information world. I was once upon a time a chief knowledge officer. So I know a thing or two, believe it or not, about content. We would often say content is king, but data is the king's sovereign wealth fund. And, and so, it's, so it's not lost on me, of course, that you have a tremendous opportunity here that uh, as, as you begin to have a platform that is, is more mobile. Uh, it's a potential gold mine in terms of data content and data capture, et cetera. So that's, that's, a more, that, that's, if you didn't want anybody else to know that, I'm sorry, I've just given away the little secret there. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I, I just, think other people might be onto our secret. <laughs> yeah. Patrick. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, it's a fantastic platform and we do compare it, you know, I, I, I know that many in the industry compare it to the LinkedIn of the, of the cannabis industry. Um, and I, you know, one of the key parts about uh, evolving our industry together as a community is, 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 is education. And the majority of the 40,000 um, uh, members within LeafWire have some type of knowledge to contribute to the conversation that's happening within LeafWire. And as Jeff alluded to, going down certain rabbit holes, they're really, really informative. Um, and you've got real experts and, and people with lots of knowledge sharing that within this, this platform. I found that super, super valuable in, in areas that I have not known much about. So I wanted to give uh, kudos on that, on that front. And then second, the question to you, Peter, is that it might be an early, too early to have an answer for this, but are you seeing more chatter um, and content focused around sustainability, around purpose centricity, around um, SDGs and ESG, environmental social governance, et cetera? Are you seeing that or... or is that, a, is that a question maybe a little bit granular? Um, so what I would say is I'm definitely seeing more um, events and webinars pop up around those terms and causes that are becoming something that people are more and more talking about or scheduling or holding you know, a, a panel. Or, um, so I, I'm definitely seeing, uh, over, I'd say over the last year, and it, it, so it's possible I'm just paying a little more attention to it now because I've gotten to know Jeff and, and Regenibus. But uh, th that's what I would say in, in a concrete way that I, I feel like that I've noticed is I'm seeing more and more people bringing up topics for discussion, whether it's a webinar or a conference or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, and that's great. I mean, obviously, the last year has really... Uh, for a number of different reasons, the pandemic, et cetera, and, and cannabis being... Um, uh, you know, evolving so quickly. I think that that's a real sign, particularly that you're seeing that too within your own platform, that these these conversations are happening, um, which is a great thing, of course, as we move towards a, a more purposeful, sustainable industry. So yeah. that's that's very exciting. And I think this Wonderful. time next year, we'll, we'll probably have even more to, to discuss on that front. I'm sure. Yeah. Peter, uh, listen, thanks ever so much again for taking time out of your busy schedule and for, for to, you know, to be uh, uh, willing to come on our, our show and into the meeting. It's both a show and a meeting. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate it and certainly appreciate you and all of the, the work that you're doing in terms of really helping this community uh, find each other. And I, and I think that's, that's, a, a, that's, that's a very, very uh, worthwhile thing that you've built and that's a tremendous vision so we'll, we'll keep well, a very close eye on what's happening yeah well thank you jeff as always it's great to him be in a conversation and you know on a show here with you again uh, and i will say to anyone else there if you're not a member yet come join us leafwire.com it's free to join uh whether you're looking for a job in the industry or have one we have a job board with 1100 jobs that are open mm -hmm. uh we'd love to have you be part of the community you know the, the bigger we get the stronger it is for everybody so 
come check us out. And anyone that wants to connect with me, uh, I'm on there all day. So you can shoot, shoot me a message on LeafWire. Great stuff. Peter, um, don't forget uh, to drop your your email address and, and all the details that you've just uh, shared with us in chat. In chat. Yeah. Um, people will pick that up. Um, we'll, do. we'll maintain a very good contact, of course, because at some point, you and I and Patrick are going to get together for a, 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 a an adult beverage. Deal. Okay. Okay. Forward Great us. stuff. Um, wonderful. Um, so we're going to move swiftly along. Um, we're running a little bit behind, but we'll catch up. Uh, next, we have our third panel uh, and, and final panel. And um, we have from Cannabis Doing Good, Kelly Perez, president, and Courtney Mathis, CEO. So two for the price of one. Um, and we're going to sort of build a little bit more on this, this notion of communities of interest and movement making and, and networking. Because frankly, the work that Kelly and Courtney have been doing for, for a couple of years now is phenomenal. Um, and, and we're gonna hear a little bit more about that too. Um, certainly around creating a purpose-driven cannabis community, which is music to our ears, of course, at Regenibus, as Patrick and I wax lyrical, uh, you know, no end about the, the need for us to think from a purpose-centric perspective. But how do we go about doing that? And that's something we're going to dig into now. Um, uh, Courtney, I see you. Uh, Kelly, are you there? Kelly, hi, there you are. I had to just scroll across. Um, great to see you both uh, and welcome. Um, I, I reference cannabis doing good, but perhaps just for the, for, for, the, for the audience, those tuning in, just tell us a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, you introduce yourselves better than I could, of course but then talk a little bit about cannabis doing good and how it fits into the broader um, sort of affiliations that, that you're doing. And then we'll dive in a little bit more, uh, a bit more specific. I don't know who wishes to lead. I don't know if you have uh, sort of Patrick and I, we're, we're never quite sure who should, who should lead. Off. Yeah. You do. You do it's, not, it's not two for the price of one. It's double the cost. <laughs> just, just to put that out there. I'm Kelly. Yeah. Lovely right. to meet you all. Um, Courtney and I feel so honored to be in community with you all. We have, rolled up our sleeves and have been doing this in community, connecting cannabis companies to their local communities for six years. Um, and we did it because racial justice was critically important to us. We wanted to make sure communities who built this industry benefited from it. And we really did not see that. We didn't see how that would happen. And lo and behold, how it happened is we did community engagement on a very uh, local level. And from that needed to make the business case for why you do this. And we have regulatory reasons, we have business reasons, etc. But we really saw things fleshing out in community benefit, environmental sustainability, and racial justice. We didn't necessarily talk about it that way with all of our clients. We talked about it to what they needed and really tried to frame it out in terms of how are you a community asset knowing that by doing this, we are educating community. We are breaking down barriers between efforts, nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't know about the UN sustainability goals. We didn't know about ESGs, and, but in fact, that's exactly what we have been doing on the local level. So to be connected with you all, we, we often are breaking down systems. We are often making connections between policy and community and why you do this and how it benefits you. So what an honor to be doing it with all of you because we are also community. Um, I want to give Courtney a chance to talk. So that's where we started as as consultants. Yeah. Go yeah. We are bigger. So good to have you, Kelly. Great. Good to have you here. Courtney, are you there? I'm here. Nice to see everyone. You Thank are. you so much for having us. Um, we really feel like we're, you know, swimming in a pond of our people. Uh, when we're talking to all of you. So thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Patrick, for giving us some space to do that. As Kelly said, we, you know, we've been consulting for six years and about three years into that journey, decided we wanted to go much bigger, much quicker and generate really tremendous impact. So we founded Cannabis Doing Good, which really strives to create an economic driver for social change. And we do that by activating a conscious cannabis sector and consumer. Um, if you go to our website today, you'll see basically what is a market test. We spent three years testing the market to see if there was a need, a want, and a desire for a purpose-driven community. We did this with events, with awards, with digital campaigns. Um, we were one of the first awards programs in the country in cannabis to recognize racial justice efforts by companies specifically. I'm really proud of that, still doing that every year. 
our website is about to relaunch because the way that we activate this conscious cannabis sector is through our membership program. Um, so just to give you an idea kind of what that looks like, a member joins Cannabis Doing Good, they can come in and immediately take our racial equity assessment or our sustainability assessment or our community benefit assessment. We're launching, of course, with racial equity assessment to see how they're doing in key topic areas. From there, we offer programming and tools and resources so businesses have a path forward. There's such a huge gap in the industry right now um, around here's what you should do and then here's all the ways to do it. We talk about racial justice, we talk about sustainability, we talk about community benefit, um, and those things are really nice to put in, in, in your social media. They're really nice things to put in your investment package, but how does a business actually go about doing it? And so our goal with our membership program is to capture those businesses that aspire to do good, to do better, to give them assessments, to measure up how they're doing and to give them all the tools and resources to actually get better with programming and curriculum and events. And then after all of that, we offer up the opportunity for them to, for businesses to apply to be a cannabis doing good uh, or basically to represent the cannabis doing good ethos by holding the badge. Um, I actually took off my little pen here. I don't know if you can see, but this is our logo. Mm -hmm. So imagine this like cute little geometric heart being on your packaging or your signature line or your storefront as a way for consumers and other business businesses, supply chain, vendors, distributors, manufacturers to identify you as a cannabis doing good company. And then rinse and repeat. You've become a member, you've done the assessment, you've gone through programming, you've applied for the badge. Then we have lots of ways to, to basically demonstrate that you are a cannabis doing a company. And then the next year you take the assessment again and we start over and see how you're doing and how to do better. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how we create this, this cannabis doing good ecosystem. Transparently, one of the things that we haven't mastered yet is how to really engage the consumer. Our goal is to really activate the consumer as well as the business and we're working on that. Um, and we're right in the middle of a fundraise as most startups are. So Peter, when Peter was talking earlier about it, being a two person team, we know that pain well, um, we've had lots and lots of growth, but we need a lot more growth to have really global implications for what we're doing, which I'll let Kelly talk about. Yeah, well, we are thrilled. I was, before you jump in there, Kelly, we're thrilled, uh, Patrick and I, to have you as part of our community. We're thrilled to have you as um, you know, we're in the process of just getting you um, all signed up to be a Regenerative Member Network member organization. I mean, one of the things that Patrick and I have, have always, um, is our, our view and our position, because people are going, hang on a minute, they, they, have a, they, they have a membership, but then so do you. So aren't you, aren't you competing? And one of the things that Patrick and I often will reference is that we're, we use the term pre-competitive. We, we actually think that there's just not enough time to be competitive. Competition's great because it means that you're innovative and or innovative or however you want to say that, depends which side of the world you come from. But I think it's very necessary. But certainly from our perspective, we, we see that, um, uh, if it, it, it sounds a little trite, sometimes we say that uh, the competition frankly is injustices, whether they're social, racial and or uh, environmental apathy which is just out there pretty much in everybody that's a big competition and then just ourselves and our own fears and and so one of the things that we've we've really embraced is the work that you're doing there uh, because we see it as a is really sort of action oriented it's it's amazing stuff what you're doing and, and we're, we're thrilled to have you as part of the community I, I wonder if you could just, I know Kelly's going to say something, but if can you also weave into some of the, the successes and the stories that, that, that people are now, you know, just saying and how thankful they are that you're doing this work. Can you speak a little bit to that, either, either yourself or Kelly? Absolutely. Um, Sana Packaging was already mentioned, who two years ago was our first award winner for Love Your Planet. So really, you know, able, we, were, we were able to help lift them up, right, in the public eye and educate consumers about why this is the kind of company you'd like to support, as well as educate and share the information with brands that would be interested in, in going with Sana. That's exactly what we seek to do, right? Build that, not be the North Star, inspire to the North Star, but build that um, constellation of good of which all of you are. I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And, and let the consumer know that you actually have power here and, and let brands and businesses know that you are being held to account. And in fact, let's call you in to what that means in a very pragmatic way. Uh, we have companies going deep in terms of racial justice right now. They didn't start out there. They started out with their licensing requirements, You know how they really um, superseded regulation so that they could do what they wanted to do. But in that, 
they really saw the benefit of being an asset in community. They really saw the benefit of lower um, ROI. I mean, lower employee turnover. They really saw what does it look like when companies were deemed um, essential providers. Nobody in a, as a bud tender decided to be a medical worker. What does it look like for a company to really care for your people? Because we're on the inside, because we have trust, we could help do that. It wasn't that hard for us to then move to some very difficult conversations around where this industry came from, the war on drugs, how communities have paid and not really been set up to benefit and what would it look like for your business to do that and get that ROI and succeed. Yeah. Courtney, would you like to give some examples as well? Well, I just wanna say that, you know, we, we talk a lot, right, about, about impact in our own backyard, which of course is, you know, the, the North American continent. However, there is global application for what we're talking about because equity and sustainability and community benefit absolutely matter wherever you go. And so our dream is to have this, you know, cute little geometric heart all over the planet for hemp products, cannabis products on packaging so that consumers and communities are activated to hold these businesses accountable as well as to use their dollar to support businesses that are doing well. Um, and so, you know, I think when we talk about our success stories, we have a lot um, within the U.S. because that's primarily where our work has been. But we absolutely see global application, uh, Jeff, which is yeah. why when we're talking about sustainable development and ESGs, we squarely fit into those roles. We check many, many, many of the sustainable, sustainable development goal yeah. boxes. Um, it's just taking what we do and making it a little bit bigger. Yeah, I mean, uh, and we've we've referenced this in in previous conversations that uh, that Kelly Courtney and myself and Patrick have had. I've just I, I, I said your name again just for the benefit of those others listening. <laughs> he does, he knows my name. He's saying it again, um, in the sense that um, certainly the work that we're doing at Regenibus at uh, at a very sort of uh, international transnational level uh, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we we we're, we're basically framing the opportunity and the art of the possible of, of delivering the transformative shift that we really need to see in the world. So, so when we have conversations about economic impact, yes, of course, we have to lead with the dollar or the yen or the yuan or whatever, but we must not and we should not and cannot forget social impact and environmental impact because without a healthy planet, we're nothing. Without a healthy community, we're nothing. Businesses won't thrive anyway. But one of the things that we that struck us was, was of course, the, even at, a, at, a, at the micro level, what, you, what you're doing, uh, we've referenced before, we can immediately see how you could potentially franchise what you're doing and just drop it into pretty much any country as and when they get to a point that they've decided that they too should legally regulate this marketplace. And we see that as just a massive opportunity because you're doing real practical, pragmatic work. And uh, we, we love that. So you, you guys are just phenomenal. I used that word already a few times today, but there you go. go well done. Just, just, just on, the, uh, on the international front there, Patrick here, um, you know, we have a lot of folks that are tuning in all around the world, actually, um, as you mentioned, and a lot of these companies uh, and, and industries, whether it be Africa or Latin America, Europe, Asia Pac, they could be, they should be and will be leveraging um, cannabis doing good in the future in, in, in some form to, to help build a sustainable industry within these various places, areas around the world. Um, and I think, you know, it's great to start off in North America, but I really do see cannabis doing good, that platform, that vision, the community that you, you, are, you have all been building there. Um, I really do see that that as, as fitting in and plugging in all over the world. Uh, and we're definitely, as uh, at Regenibus, we will be doing our best to support that as we, because we are very much global too. We have a global conversation and we want to plug this in as where, 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 where and when we can, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. As I, I know we joked about this last time just for the benefit of everybody else. It's like sisters from other misters and brothers from other mothers. It, uh, we just l love what, what's going on there at uh, uh, when I saw CDG, of course, uh, it always just reminds me of Paris, which is the worst airport in the world, but one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Um, <laughs> so I will never forget that that little the pin that you have, CDG. Um, what um, in terms of scaling, we you know we we sort of referenced certainly in the conversation we had with with Peter, you know, there's only there's only so much two people can do. What's next for for you and your team? How, how do you anticipate building that out? Um, you know, uh, 
you're, you're nodding there, which means that the, you well, must have we a plan. Intend, we, we sure do intend to. And yeah. Some of the things you all said from your lips to God's ears, because there are places that what we do actually will make a more sense than it made here. Right. Um, there totally. are cultures and communities that the community benefit is we've seen that already. Yeah. So we, we think that we will be able to take our experience from the micro level seriously and connect it to the, the various systems that will mm -hmm. that can move it. Yeah. Um, there's really companies will be held to account. Consumers and community members will expect businesses to operate in a way that is mm -hmm. responsible and aspirational. And that's really one of the things that we do, right, is bring us all, call people in, you know, not call people out. We don't seek to be to um, take the place of, of, of um, certifications, but rather be an aggregator so that consumers can know what it is. So it will be a massive, it's going to be massive marketing campaign. I mean, we will need support. We will need buy-in. We will need many of you to share the stories that you have on doing these aspirational goals and how it works for your business and in your hyper-local communities. Very good. Yeah, that, yeah I, I think that that's exactly it. Um, and I think one of the biggest things around scaling for us, honestly, has been, uh, Kelly and I love to say this because it makes us feel very grown up, but we recently hired a data scientist and um, she has come onto our team from the Colorado, from Colorado University, and she is helping us develop surveys so we can actually capture purpose-driven data in the cannabis sector specifically. Um, this has been a huge dream of ours for years and years, but when we're looking to make the case for why businesses should engage in purpose-driven behavior, why they should engage in environmental justice and racial justice and community benefit and sustainability and regenerative agriculture, right? We need to make the case for that. And we believe that consumers do care. We see it, in, you know, uh, emulated in many, many other sectors. We don't have this data specifically for cannabis. So we're really proud to have this data scientist on board. That's a huge leap for us in terms of growth to be able to capture this data to really make the case. We're also capturing social responsibility and sustainability metrics like baseline data for businesses across the country to sort of figure out based on market size and region what are you doing right yeah. what are you doing for your social responsibility what is the baseline of where we're at because that way when we're developing our or continuing to develop our programming at cdg we can really meet the industry where it is and of course that will depend on market not only by state but of course by country um and so that's, that's been really exciting for us. I think that's a huge point in our growth. And we've hired several people in the last year. Um, we've brought three people onto our team, but obviously, as we all know, growth makes all things possible and so does capital. So yeah. that's why we're in the middle of a fundraise because we're doing yeah. what we can with the growth that we have. And we hope to have you know ongoing growth as we continue to increase our capital. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I don't know if you have both dropped in your details into the, 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 the chat space, uh, if you could do that. I would like to do is, um, given uh, we're approaching 20 after the hour, is just to open up to, well, we've got a couple of questions coming in, but I wonder if there's any of our Regenibus member network uh, folk and or advisory board members who, um, who everybody else can see on screen, if anybody has any questions, uh, either for Kelly or Courtney, or indeed for, for Peter, or indeed for Sherry. Um, let's, let's open it up there, and then I'm, I'm going to have a little look at the, the Q&A and, and, um, and, and chat, make sure I'm not missing anything. Anybody have any questions for anybody? Jeff, this is Bob. I, I got a question. Uh, uh, and, and I guess we go to Courtney or, or, uh, or Kelly. Uh, have you seen an uptick in interest uh, surrounding the ESG principles uh, since the election of the Biden administration? That's a good question. To translate it into regular words, Bob, because no one says that, right? Um, so we still have to do some education. We can call it, right? It just depends where you are, whose table you are, where you're talking. What we've seen is an uptick in um, folks wanting to tackle racial equity and racial justice, which is clearly that as well. We have, it's not called that yet, but we're, we're thrilled to be able to work on the inside of companies doing very difficult work to change from you know, performative activism, activism around a black square to what does it actually look like to be an anti-racist company? And that's a pretty big deal. We've always been a little bit early. And so to be squarely in our space in the, in the moment of the times, um, feels, you know, very, very good. Courtney, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just say that really trying to 
to capture, I think what Patagonia has done really well, which is that uh, sustainability is environmental, is environmental justice is racial justice. And so we have seen an increase in companies talking about sustainability and racial justice. I think that would be really transformative is to see those conversations combined and to realize that as you begin to care for the planet, you're also going to care for those that are going to be the most impacted by by the wrath the planet is undoing. And those people are most likely to be black, brown and or poor. Um, and so that is really where we're seeing the conversation drive. And um, we mentioned Sana again, gosh, I hope they're listening because they're really getting a, a, they're getting a lot of buzz today. But Sana Packaging is one of the companies we've talked to about how they really want to move their conversation from sustainability to really talking about environmental justice as racial justice. Um, and that's really exciting for us. If I could just throw one more thing in, Bob, one of the most amazing things that happens when we work with a company is the internal um, passion for environmental sustainability comes out of employees when we have helped leadership set up a CSR group, right? We were some of the crafters of CS, what CSR looks like in cannabis. So based on the demographic, like there's a ton of interest within companies. We've seen things change that we had nothing to do with. All we did is set up this kind of ethos within a company and it stimulated its own work around environmental sustainability. It's a li- that's a little bit easier for people conceptually than equity or justice. Community benefit is all those things, right? And I want to shout out People's Dispensary because they're here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, they're model yeah. business. That's everything yeah. they do. I was going to do the same, Kelly. You beat me to it because I, I see Christine De La Rosa has joined us. I know she was busy doing a, one of 20 events that she's probably doing today. Um, looking remarkable, uh, Christine. Do um, you have anything to say? Because your mic was, was open. Yeah, I wanted just to say like what I love about this whole synergy that's happening on this Regenibus panel is that you know, Kelly and Courtney are, they wouldn't say this, but I'll say this, they were so instrumental in my growth as a CEO and for our company, like they've done sessions with our employees, they've done so much work to help us become who we are. And they, and because they're doing this, they're literally doing good all over the place. Like that's how we got to Santa Santa Packaging. Um, we're going to be using all of their products for all of our brand new um, product lines going out in Michigan, New Jersey, Arizona, Nevada, California. But I wouldn't really know about them because I, unless I had known Kelly and Courtney, like I didn't really know. And so you see how all of these things that they're doing, that individual companies help us all become this larger community of sustainability that I didn't really know a lot about until I met you, Jeff, and you, Patrick. So like, what's so cool is all the synergies that are happening within within the cannabis industry where we're all helping each other figure out a little piece of the pie. And I, I just think that's really exciting. It's exciting for me. I'm about to be on a panel with Asana, with Ron from Sana, talking about sustainability at the New York Canna Gather on Thursday. And you can see just how small our community is, but how much these, these smaller communities create these really big ideas that sort of permeate throughout the industry. And so I think that that is a huge testament to Kelly and Courtney, of course, to you, Jeff and Patrick and everybody on the call is that we are in communication and we might not see the movement as fast as we wanna see it, but we're definitely seeing the movement become a movement. So I just wanted to you know, shout out Kelly and Courtney because literally I would not be where I am today without them. Um, and they've done so much good for my employees and for my company. That's Thanks, great. Christine. Yeah, thank and, you, and just to, And just to add to the point there, um, and, and, and as myself and Jeff have, have alluded to many times, making money and doing good are not mutually exclusive. So there has to be everything that we're building here. There has to be a business case behind everything here or else none of us survive, of course. So, uh, and that's the beauty about environmental social governance. And within that governance, there's the E, the economic piece, um, uh, social, environmental, economic. There has to be a business case. And we spent a decade working with corporations um, as they started to build sustainability into their businesses. And these were Unilever's, Procter & Gamble's. Sustainability was just a, a side thing back then. But then it started to become a, a, a business driver and, and there were great cases made behind, uh, behind the scenes. And what, what was the ROI of, of putting that in and putting the investment into being a good and purpose-driven company? So I think that's really important for 
us as a as a community as we as we continue to grow that this is business too at the same time it's it's good business and cannabis doing good is a perfect example of of uh of, of, of a business that's doing good and and also making money yeah thank you jeff I, or jeff and patrick we just want to say also that i know that i speak for you as well because you know we we really believe we can make the right thing the easy thing that will be a legacy that we're really proud of and if you can if we can really demonstrate that you can do good and be abundant what better pathway to actually achieve equity? What better pathway to actually achieve sustainability, right? So when we talk about, you know, cannabis doing good, being an economic driver for social change, that sounds like a, real, a mouthful, but it's the truth. And so we want to make the right thing, the easy thing. We want to demonstrate that you can do good and be abundant because that is how we're going to get to the end goal that we all really want. Um, and we can't do it without all of you. I mean, Christine's gushing was just uh, ridiculously moving and sweet, um, but it's saying it's whether it's, you know, Peel's dispensary, Regenibus, Sauna, so many of people on the call, Hoban, of course, leading in hemp and uh, regenerative agriculture and lots of other incredible things. Um, we have to be a team to really achieve this together. So when Kelly says constellation of stars, that's not fluff. That's the truth. We have to do this together. I love all of this uh, because, again, uh, uh, this is music to our ears at, at Regenibus. Uh, we, we set out some time ago to sort of capture the hearts and minds and the imagination that, that's clearly here in, in this space to, to recognize that if, if we can build this nascent industry, cannabis and hemp industry, in the, in the right way, the correct way, we can then create regenerative growth for all not only in the cannabis industry, but frankly, for all humanity. And that's why we tied it back to the sustainable development goals. There is a huge opportunity here if we, to, to effect transformative change. And, and, and I think everybody who's, who's here either listening in or is part of the Regenerative Member Network or is uh, an advisory board member, we know who you are because, and why we, we want you to continue to be part of this movement is because you're, you're doing some incredible work and it's it's very important uh, i'm about to wrap up um so i don't know if there's any other any other points to be raised um I think frederica has her hand up uh, let's see that yeah thank yes. you um so quick question uh you know you ladies first of all today has been amazing um i've been taking notes the whole time it's so much information given um and so uh, Kelly and Courtney, you two uh, spoke about um, companies that you've worked with and how oftentimes, you know, they have the bare minimum uh, in terms of, you know, how are they being sustainable? How are they dealing with, um, with equity issues and things of that nature? And so my question is, what if any role do you see the federal government playing uh, in, you know, kind of raising the standards, raising the base level, if you will, um, with some of these pieces. And we're seeing uh, Schumer and Booker and Wyden, you know, on this kind of state tour, statewide tour uh, in regards to um, bringing the MORE Act back into play. And, you know, um, we spoke earlier today about the Safe Banking Act and things of that nature. So at a federal level, we know that things are moving and just curious to, to what role you uh, see the government playing. This government, Frederica, sorry, just joking, just joking. I mean, I hope that the wisdom and the knowledge and the, you know, tries and states will be honored, obviously. We don't want to go backward. Um, we don't have so many social equity, racial justice efforts to celebrate, but we have some. And so it's really important that um, the federal government knows about what community benefit looks like and looks at some systems like um, if we have new emerging issues that aren't yet the solution isn't evidence-based that we don't set up systems that just benefit the nonprofit industrial complex, right? We really want to make sure that local communities are benefiting because even when federally legal cannabis is, is local, right? Each local community decides what it's going to look like. And clearly we'll have some guidelines. I hope that we've informed some of those guidelines. And I hope that it's continuously iterate, iterative to improve because as we know, the MORE Act took a real dip there in terms of, of, of being aspiration, but when you got to the granular, not doing what we'd hoped it would do on paper. So that is gonna be constantly what we're doing. It's, it's, it's dynamic all of the time. So learning and changing and growing, what is a little bit unfortunate to us is that that, that economic driver for the good isn't as clear, right? So we're going to have to constantly be honing that and ESG 
the UN sustain, that's part of it, but how do you make that something that people on the local level can touch and see themselves as connected to, and that we do have a movement of folks who are aspirational, what is the very best we can do with this raw material to be social change in local communities, as well as inform all other in, all of the other industries. We are underdogs, we have a lot of vulnerabilities, and we have an enormous amount of potential to really aim very high. Yeah, wow. I, I'm afraid we could talk forever. I, I know we could, um, but unfortunately we, we are time constrained. Um, we all need to move to Mars where we have more hours in a day. Um, I would like to just, as we wrap up, just to say thank you uh, to Sherry, Sherry Haskell, uh, to Peter Vogel, to Kelly Perez and to Courtney Mathis for being uh, wonderful panelists and just being good sports uh, to, to share all of the great work that you're doing. We, we are super grateful. And I think uh, if they didn't know it beforehand, they probably are now that, that uh, those tuning in are probably also, and I speak for them, they're probably also very grateful for the work that you're doing. From, from our perspective, as we wrap up, just to give some, some sense making of, of what we've just uh, what we've just done for the last 90 minutes is we recognize in, in this cannabis and hemp industry that we need to have less of a mono capital approach and more of a multi capital approach. And there's a there's a, a rationale for kicking off with someone, you know, as as deep into this business from an economic in a capital perspective as Sherry, who not only uh, leads with her bank account and her investment account, but leads with a head and a heart, which I think is something that um, we should take more note of when we are seeking uh, investors in, in your business. Ask them questions, find out what's in their head and their heart, um, rather than just uh, seeking that economic capital. Then we, as we move in to talk, to, to have conversation with Peter, I mean, he's been very instrumental in bringing together through his platform at LeafWire, this, this uh, both the notion of human capital, um, which is either a term you love or hate, there's, there's no middle ground, um, but this notion of, of being able to sort of create this space where where humanity can connect with one another uh, in, in around this common subject, but also because of the role of education that uh, LeafWire is bringing, then there's a tremendous amount of intellectual capital, which is the third capital. So we've had economic capital, human capital, intellectual capital. And then if we look at the work that Courtney and Kelly are doing, they really then have, have helped really fine tune the, the this piece around natural capital, which is the environment, which as I've referenced earlier, without the environment, we are nothing, all of us, as I had a post earlier this week on LinkedIn, without a healthy climate, we're done. And then I think um, the fifth and final capital is probably the most important uh, in reference to the sustainable development goals, and that's social capital. Um, and so I think that as we look at these, this multi-capital approach, I think what, what we have uh, all done and what you, you, the four of you are doing is, is instrumental. I think it's, it's, a, it's the A team. It's a very powerful team, very powerful group of folks. So thank you ever so much. And thanks to everybody else for tuning in, listening in, uh, whether you're catching this live or you are capturing this um, in a recording, uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, really, it's been wonderful to have you here. There is a tremendous amount of data in the chat room, including uh, I've asked uh, a good friend of ours, Samantha Sage, to just drop a note in there about uh, a survey that she's running. Uh, I know Kelly referenced surveys earlier. Take a look in the chat room, um, capture it, do a do a, a catch all and take it to a Word doc so you've, you have it for a later date. Um, but just to, to, to close off and say thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for, for bringing us into the show. Um, thanks, as always, for the work that you're doing. He's a, a big hero of mine. And thanks to everybody for, for being part of this. Um, look forward to seeing you again at some point. Um, that's it from us. Uh, oh, and and one, fi one final point is next month for the next uh, member meeting, we'll hopefully, we're working on bringing the United Nations, the SDG conversation in into this meeting and we'll hopefully have one of our our, our partners uh, a multi-state operator here in the us to talk about their their esg uh, positioning so we'll take it to the to the next level uh, and we look forward to having you everybody have a wonderful 420 and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon take care bye thank, thank you all you. thanks everyone take care